All right, turn to the person next to you and say, it's a new year, baby! Oh man, I'm ready to go. Well, we are, uh, that song kind of really just brings it all together because we're going to talk about uh, this hustle and this bustle and this crazy life that we all are trying to live. And again, it's a new year. And so some of us are like, man, I don't know if this hustle and bustle is working out, but we'll get to all that. Let me pray and we're going to get going. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for this day, this time, this new year, this reset button that we, uh, we can enter into. Uh, with the turn of a calendar and uh, the turn of a, a decade. And so, God, I pray today that you would speak, that these would be, as we say every week, these would be your words. And God, I, uh, I just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here and to, uh, more than anything, to be poured into by your spirit. Uh, and then also on the flip side of that, have an opportunity to pour ourselves into you through worship and through uh, through service and through giving and through all that stuff. Uh, God, thank you for being a God who, who is available to us with that kind of connection. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. We pray and everybody said, amen, amen. Well, it was about, I guess, I don't know, a year and a half ago or something like that. And I know I've told this story before, but uh, it seemed like a good place to start uh, this series as well. It was probably about a year and a half ago. Again, I know I've exhausted this. I apologize. I'm not trying to be like a downer or whatever, but I was going through some stuff in my life, right? And in my uh, personal life. And it was, it was just a lot. It was a lot. And one of the things that I wasn't anticipating in that season, which is really silly, I definitely should have, but one of the things I wasn't anticipating was the the weight of not only all the stuff that I was wrestling with in my marriage at the time and in my, uh, just in my, my whole family dynamic and how that was all kind of changing and, and shifting, I wasn't quite ready for uh, just this, this other factor where just the normal day-to-day -day routines, which can be a lot, like all of us know, how those things would couple together and it would almost come to this place where it just felt like crippling. I don't really even know how, how else to say it. Yeah, I was a little depressed. Yeah, I was struggling. Yeah, I was uh, just all that stuff. But then on top of it, I was like, man, I'm a pastor. And just to kind of fill you guys in, uh, being a pastor, so much of this gig is you're pouring yourself into others. And if you're not careful, it could be really easy uh, to forget to be poured into. And so I found myself in this very real place where all the stuff in my personal life and trying to be a good leader and trying to be a, a, a good dad and then a single dad and all that, and it just all these dynamics kind of came together. And again, about a year and a half ago, I stopped by the speedway by my house. I went in and I was like, man, I, I just felt, guys, I'm not, I don't know how to say, I just felt like a million pounds sat on my shoulders. And I just went in and uh, I kind of looked over my shoulder. I was like, make sure no church people are in here. Uh, and I, uh, I bought a pack of, of cigarettes. And then I was like, okay, do I need, do I need to get the, no, I think I have wine at home. Uh, and so I, I went home and I, I remember putting the kids to bed and I just couldn't sleep and I'm doing laundry and all this stuff. And, and, and I just ended up uh, there was this new development across the street uh, from where I lived at the time, and it was a brand new road that went in, uh, but cars weren't allowed to drive on it. And at like one in the morning, I walked, I don't know, 100 feet across the street to this new road. I just laid on my back, staring up at the stars, smoking cigarettes. And some of you are here for the first time today, and you're like, whoa, what kind of... I don't smoke. I'm not a smoker. It was it was a, it was a thing. Okay, I was. Uh, and others of you are like, "This is a cool church, man. Look at this guy." And <laughs> and uh, and and you got that wrong, kids. It's not cool to smoke. And so, but anyways, I was feeling all sorts of stuff, and and I'm sitting there, and I got this. I'm drinking my cheap red wine, and I'm. It's sort of through the haze of the smoke that was sort of floating between me and the stars. I remember. Uh, I remember just having this acknowledgement. I was just like, you know, I, um, I, don't, I don't think I can do this like this for much longer. I don't think I can carry all of this stuff doing it this way anymore. Because I, I'd, I'd sort of made this commitment to myself that I wasn't going to be the wounded puppy who comes out on stage every week with his tail between his legs. And I don't know if I did that well or not, but 
I just made that commitment. And so I was trying to put, put on this, but I was just, I felt again, like the weight of a, just all this stuff on my shoulders. And it was that night that something sort of clicked that I was like, something has to change. I can't keep doing this. And you're looking at me and you're saying, well, maybe that was like depression or maybe that, yeah, it was. And, and maybe, but it was also this. And here's what I've come to realize. In that season, right then, right there, 18 months ago or whenever it was, there's another word that I would attach to it. It's, it's simply this. It's burnout. I was just burnt out. I was trying to be all this stuff. I was trying to do all this stuff. I was trying to continue on like everything was fine and everything wasn't fine. And I was burnt out. Now, maybe you're looking at me and you're saying, uh, Ryan, that's not my story, but I think, I think I know how you feel. Because you're not doing the wine and cigarettes thing at one in the morning, laying on a, a road, listening to Ryan Adams on your phone, laying next to you. You're not doing that, but, but uh, it's showing itself in different ways. See, again, there's a word for this. It's this word, burnout. This is a word, believe it or not, it's become more and more popular in our society, so popular, this term burnout, that has actually been added to the medical dictionary. Check this out. Here's how burnout is defined medically. You ready for this? It's an exhaustion of physical or emotional strength, usually as a result of prolonged stress or frustration. This is an actual medical condition. And it's such a real medical condition, condition that we find people all over this great country of ours are walking and, and experiencing it, but they don't even know what it is. And that's kind of the idea behind this series is we're saying, hey, I think there are a lot of you who in different ways are feeling what I felt a year and a half ago, and maybe you haven't even acknowledged it, but you're, you're sort of in a place like I was, staring up at the stars, the haze of smoke between you and them, and you're saying something happened to change, but you don't know how to do it. You don't know how to navigate it. You don't know how to move forward. And so that's what this series is all about that we're doing today, kicking off. We're calling it Give It a Break. And it's a series about how we can have more margin, how we can be people who pursue healthy rest, how we can be people who, who pursue healthy rhythms, how we can be people who pursue healthy relationships, because that's another area that so many of us don't always think about the importance of those relationships breathing life into us. A lot of our relationships are a drain, leave us with no margin. So we're saying, how do we change all that and pursue something different? And so here's what I know, it's a new year. And I don't like doing like the typical like resolution type sermon series, but I know that there's some of us, you came up with some resolutions and I'm just going to be honest, maybe it was losing 10 pounds, maybe it was getting more organized, maybe it was being better about your budget and you might do okay with some of those things, but if we're honest, I think more of us than not, if you had to pinpoint like the biggest thing that you wrestle with in your life, maybe you didn't even notice it till right now, I bet it has something to do with the margin that you create. And so there's this church out in Colorado, they're called Flatirons, and it's a church, I just, I just love this church, and every now and then I'll stumble upon something they, they're, they're doing, and, and they did a series on this same topic months and months ago, and I just thought that'd be so good for us, because I think so many of us are wrestling with this. So let's get into this. So I borrowed some stuff from them, but here we go. Let's get into this here this morning. Um, did you know this? Let's talk about burnout. Burnout accounts for $190 billion in healthcare spending in America alone, okay? So this is like a real thing. Let me keep going, though. Uh, burnout, actually, 50% of Americans feel burnout multiple times per year. Moments where you are just so tired, where you get in the car and you space out on the 30-minute drive home, you don't even remember the drive, you, get in the, uh, you pull in the garage and you say, how did I get here? 50% of us experience burnout at different points during the year, but this is what really gets me, is that one out of four, 25% of Americans feel burnout every single day. Look down the road, one out of four of us are just, every day, it's just a grind, it's an exhaustion. We are literally, we are individuals, we are people who are living 
with emotional, mental, physical, spiritual exhaustion, and it's just become a way of life. Now, some of us will even, you'll push back and you'll say, Ryan, come on, can't we just, really, can't we just be a little tougher? Can't we just be a little strong? Can't, do we really have to make a big deal about this, that people are tired? It's not just people are tired. We see suicide rates are higher than they've ever been in our country. Depression rates continue to skyrocket. Something has to change. So let's start here. Let's build a little bit of a foundation. Again, to help you to kind of, uh, let's see, is this something that's real? Is this something that I'm actually dealing with? It sounds like maybe, but Brian, help me out. So let me give you like four, I don't know, we'll just call these four different variables that might show you or showcase that you struggle with burnout. The first one is this. You're always saying, it's just a season. Do you do that? You ever find yourself, you come home from work and, uh, and you're just, again, you're drained, you're exhausted, your kids are playing in the other room, all you wanna do is sit down and just sort of uh, not engage anyone or anything and your spouse comes in and they look at you and they say, what's going on? You say, it's all right, I'm, it's, just, it's just a season. And some of you, your spouse has looked at you and you said, and say, you've been saying that for three years. You've been saying that for a while now, it's not just a season. Others of us, here's another one, another clue that you might be wrestling with burnout is you find yourself regularly zoning out. Like I said, you get in the car after work, you take the 40 minute drive home and you don't even remember the drive. You, you, you get home and, uh, and you immediately go in the bathroom, right? And, and you're in there for 45 minutes just scrolling on your phone and, and your wife is like, what is going on? You find yourself just completely, again, you, you, you just watch TV and you don't even remember the last two, three, four shows that you just watch because you're just so tired, you're so exhausted, you're so checked out. If that's something that you're doing regularly, there's a good chance you're just burnt out. Here's another one. More and more of us, um, we're lashing out for, for reasons that aren't really that big a deal. You find that your fuse is getting shorter and shorter, and so you, you lash out at your wife, you lash out at your, your husband, you lash out at your boyfriend or your girlfriend, you're, you're lashing out at your friends, you're lashing out at your kids, and it's just like over silly, trivial, minor stuff. But it's because your fuse is just so short. Or here's just one more clue that maybe, maybe you're wrestling with burnout. It says, um, you're constantly obsessing about other people's lives. Like Facebook is hell to you because you get on there and you're just like, man, I wish I had that. I wish we could take that vacation. I wish I had those kind of well-behaved kids or I wish I had uh, that kind of house, wish I had that kind of car, wish I had that kind of spouse, wish I had that kind of husband, wife, girlfriend, whatever. And, and, you're, and you're just thinking like, I, I wish I had that life. Anything to not be you. And I keep going, we could keep listing more and more things, but if any of these things sound like you, if one of these boxes checked, there's a chance that you're, you're just wrestling with this. If multiple of these things are checked, then there's a really good chance you're just burnt out. But here's the good thing. It's a new year. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's a new year! Come on. Turn to the person on the other side and say, I know! Tell the person in front of you and say, even Louisville graduates go to college. <laughs> that's it, that's it. I'm done with the Louisville jokes. No more, 2020, that's my resolution, okay? I just wanted to sneak one more in there. All right, I felt the tension we had to, okay. Um, all right, <laughs> I'm an idiot, okay. Um, turn to... Uh, Turn to Isaiah 30 if you could. Or actually, you turn to Genesis. I'll go to Isaiah 30. I just lost like a good portion of the room there. Um, here's the cool thing is, it's, this isn't a new thing, this exhaustion, this burnout. Okay, this is a thing that's always uh, existed. It's not just the growth of social media and the, uh, you know, the, the smartphone era and all that. It's not, just, it's not just the fact that our kids are now on 100 different traveling sports teams. This has always been a thing. And we read this in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. 
It says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Isn't this, this is thousands of years ago in a much simpler time, even in Isaiah's time, here he is. And he's saying, he's saying, in rest is salvation, in quietness is strength, but you would have none of it. This is a thing that we've always as a people wrestled with because we want to go a hundred miles an hour because we want to do a hundred different things because we are comparing ourselves constantly because we think the corporate ladder is to be climbed at all times because well, there are a lot of different reasons, but it's not new to us. Yes, I think it's become more complicated, but it's not new to humanity. It's always been a thing. So now let's open it up to Genesis chapter two. If you have a Bible, you can open there with me. If you don't have a Bible, we have some on the carts. I'd love for you to just grab one and follow along, or you can grab one on the way out, and it could be our gift to you. If you're looking for the book of Genesis, right there in the beginning, very first one. We're going to camp out here the rest of the time. Here's what it says. Genesis chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 2 and 3. It says, by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So there's something really interesting that's happening here in this passage. God is weaving and he's creating and he's putting everything in place, right? He's, he's done this for six days and he gets, he gets to this moment where he creates Adam and, and Eve on day six and he looks back and he says, it's all very good. He says that, but then on day seven, what does God do? He rests. Now, have you ever thought about this? Yes, I'm sure it was hard work to create everything. I'm sure it was a challenge to put everything in its place. I'm sure it was not the, the most simple of, of uh, you know, just to make sure the earth was on just the right tilt or axis or whatever and make sure that you've got this galaxy over here and this cosmos over here and you've got all this stuff put in place. But nonetheless, we're talking about God, okay? And he created all of it in just six days. And so here's what I'm gonna go out on a limb and just say. I don't think God needed to rest. He's God. And so here's the question that I would ask. Why did he rest? Why did he stop? Why did he pause? Why did he do all this work and then find it necessary to step back, kick up his feet, and to breathe for a moment? There are a couple things. The first thing I'll say is this. I think it's really simple. I think, I think he's just being an example. I think God is saying, even though I'm God and don't need rest, I'm finding it necessary to do this. And he's setting an example for you and I, who, by the way, do need rest, but are more prone to blow through it, to continue on, to think the corporate ladder is the only thing that matters, to think that the, the money or the, the drive or the, all this stuff that we're, we're working so hard for is not that it's bad, but we're going so hard that we're never stopping. And God is saying, I'm God and I don't even need to do this, but I'm doing it as an example so that you will follow because I know, I know if you don't rest, you're gonna be hanging out on a, on a road, smoking cigarettes when you don't smoke at 1.30 in the morning, drinking red wine, listening to Ryan Adams. And I don't want that for you. I want you to breathe. I want you to be healthy. But I love this. There's another, there's a quote I want to share with, share with you by this guy named Watchman Nee. He wrote a book called Sit, Walk, Stand. And he says this. I think it's just a really cool concept, a really cool thing to think about. He said, where did Adam stand in relation to that rest of God? Adam, we are told, was created on the sixth day. Clearly then, he had no part in those first six days of work, for he came into being only at their end. God's seventh day was, in fact, Adam's first. Where God worked six days and then enjoyed his Sabbath rest, Adam began his life with the Sabbath. For God works before he rests, 
while man must first enter into God's rest and then alone he can work. And I loved, I loved when I read this, I, I thought this was so profound. Again, Adam played no part in the creation of the world. I mean, I guess on day six, he named some animals and did that kind of stuff, but he wasn't creating and yet when Adam came into the world, he enters it in this moment of Sabbath. The first thing Adam knew was Sabbath, was rest. This was the world he entered into. I am created. Whoa, God, you're kicking back. God, on the other hand, spent six days creating, weaving, and then found rest necessary, right? And here's the problem. Here's what I think, so, and this is why I love what, what Watchman he says here. This is the thing that I think so many of us get a little mixed up is we think we're God. And so we think we can go, 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 go. And then we'll just catch up with our rest at some point. But here's what God actually does. He says, no, Sabbath should be a foundation. Sabbath is what I created you into. It's the thing that charges you, that fills you. It's the, the thing where my spirit is breathing into you. And then, and then you go and you do, then you go and you work hard. Then you go and you, you pursue but again, here's what we find, and it's just this subtle little tweak, just this subtle little nuance. God says, Sabbath should be the foundation, not just a thing where you're trying to find a place to fit it. It should be the foundation. It should be the thing that matters in your life. To such a place where it is a priority. Again, so much so that God, who did not need rest, said, follow this example. I'm going to rest. You should probably do it too. But let's go back really quick. Let's, let's read that passage just one more time. Because I want to point out one more thing. Again, Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. So God actually set it apart. He said, this is so important. I'm making it holy. To be holy means to be like set apart, to be lifted up, to be acknowledged as separate, different. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So I'll say it again. God didn't need to rest, right? So why'd he do it? Ryan, you just told us to be an example. Yep, I think that's a big part of it. Here's the other one. I think the other reason that God rested on that seventh day is this. I think he just wanted to enjoy what he'd created. I think he was looking around and he was like, man, this is... I mean, he said it. This is very good. Look at this guy, Adam, and, and look at these two, Adam and Eve. Like, look, look how awkward they are right now. This is just fun to watch, you know? Trying to figure out how to be alive. Look how beautiful these animals are and how they're interacting. Look at how beautiful as the wind blows through creation. Look how beautiful. And I, I honestly think one of the other reasons that God stopped and he rested was because he wanted to enjoy what he'd created. Here's the struggle that you and I have. Is that we are so quick to go, 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 go. We are so quick to run, run, run. We are so quick to, to live these lives going a thousand miles an hour that we never really stop and just enjoy If you're putting in 60 hours of work every week, and that's, that's, if that's what it needs, and that, that's fine. If that's what your job is, and that's okay. But then, and then you come home, and all you can do is just zone out. Is it worth it? If you're grinding, and you're grinding, and you're grinding, and you're doing all this stuff because you think somehow it's going to give you uh, more value, it's going to validate you, it's going to show somebody that you're something, it's going to... Again, I'm not saying we shouldn't work hard. I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue excellence in our jobs and our lives. But 
I found, I found just a little, a, a few quotes that I thought were just kind of fitting. I saw this one. These are things you'll probably find on Pinterest or something, but um, like this, like, well, at least your gravestone will say you worked hard in this life. Or I'm almost positive this one's uh, on, on Pinterest. It never get so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. We're just going 100 miles an hour. And we're not pausing and actually, like God seemed to do and God commanded, we're not stopping and enjoying any of this life that we're trying to build. So here's what we're gonna do this morning. I'm actually gonna give you some homework. And it's pretty simple. It's simple, it's a simple assignment. It's simple homework, but that's not to say it's going to be easy for you. If you're up for it, here it is. And I think this will benefit you, here it is. I want you to consider this being your 2020 resolution. I want you, starting today, to be intentional about creating a day of rest in your week. Now, I want you to be intentional. I want you to do everything you can to create a day of Sabbath in your week. Now, some of you are looking at me and you're saying, Ryan, that is, that's not possible with my work schedule. It's not possible with the pace of things. Okay, then if it's absolutely not possible, that is plan A, that is what I think you should fight for and do everything you can to try and move some things around and make some things happen. And if you can, uh, try to adapt a work schedule, whatever. But if it's absolutely not possible, then here's uh, as uh, other, you know, sort of a, a part B, then I want you to do everything you can to carve out intentional moments in your week. I want you to sit down with your spouse or sit down with your, whoever you need to sit and just, I want you to say, okay, then if, if we can't set a whole day aside, then we're gonna find intentional moments where we are working Sabbath into our schedule, where we're working it in. I think the best thing is to say, we're gonna give it a whole day, but if you can't do that, then find intentional moments where you can. But here's, now here's what you're doing. You're looking back at me and you're saying, but what is it, I, like, I don't even know what that means. What, do I just lay on my couch all day? What does Sabbath look like? So here's, we're gonna give fun. I'm gonna give you three principles that I want you to build into your Sabbath. You can write these down if you're the type that likes to write things down, all right? Here's the first one, you ready? Food, everyone say food. Here's what I want you to do. On your Sabbath, I want you to plan to eat your favorite food. Everyone say food. If you enjoy cooking, make your favorite food. If not, go to your favorite restaurant and enjoy your food. We're talking about your Sabbath. You're setting, so if God said, I'm going to rest to enjoy, and you don't even work any rest in at all, so this is, I'm just trying to help you out, give you some prayers. How can you enjoy your Sabbath? Let's start here. We all like to eat, right? So cook some food you like to eat. If cooking's not your thing, but McDonald's chicken nuggets are, that's a good Sabbath meal. Here's the second thing. On your Sabbath, say people. I want you to spend time with people you actually enjoy. This could be your spouse, hopefully, <laughs> your kids or your close friends. If you have extended family that adds stress to your life, make time to connect with them during one of your days of work or days of prep, okay? But let the people you spend time with on your Sabbath actually breathe life into you and bring you joy. So some of us who do this thing, you're, you're sitting here and you're saying, well, Sunday is probably the best day for me. It's my day of Sabbath. This is, I come to church. This is like, so I worship God. That's a big part of Sabbath too. I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but you're, you're sitting here and you're saying, but then on Sunday nights, we get together with the whole family and it's fine and all, but I kind of hate those people. And here's, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I hope that's not the case. But maybe it can be a drain to you. And maybe there needs to be a conversation where you just say, you know what? Like, I'm trying to set some time aside so I don't end up like my pastor. 
laying on some road across the street from my house. So I'm trying to create healthy rhythms and Sabbath. And consider, maybe on that Sabbath day, you're just intentional about hanging out with your girlfriends, hanging out with your guys, hanging out with your, your spouse, doing something with your family, going on a hike, going on a walk, and I'll get to that in a second. But instead, so many of us, we just, we say, well, I, I, I have to do this. What we do, it's what my family does, and it's just a drain to you, and you, you're just tired. Mix it up. Be careful, be careful about how you navigate that. Don't break your grandmother's heart. Here's the last thing, play. Food, people, play. Do something you love. Do things that you find fun. Go to a museum, watch a football game. If you enjoy it, you should do it. So again, I think part of the problem is we just don't know how to do Sabbath. We don't know how to rest. Your rest should breathe life into you. And maybe this sounds selfish. Maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, well, Ryan, this is all like things that I do. It's self-help, blah, blah, blah. God instituted Sabbath. God said, I want your life not to be this exhausting, monotonous grind. I want you to breathe and enjoy this thing that I've given you. I created you for a reason. So breathe well. See, for me, here's what I realize. I'll close with this. When I was laying there on the road that night, and I had this revelation, I had this thought, like, I just can't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can just keep at this pace. I just, I, I'm not gonna, I, and I just knew I can't make it to the other side like this. I can't. I'm not gonna last long in ministry like this. So I just started giving myself a little bit more grace I started to become a little bit more intentional. I'd always tell our staff, like, make sure you're breathing, make sure you're breathing, make sure you're breathing. But I, I realized I wasn't really breathing well. So I just, I, I, it wasn't like the snap of fingers, but it was pretty, pretty much. I, I just started saying things like, you know what? If I'm in the midst of a two-day writing session and I wrap up that second day and it's only two o'clock and, uh, and you know, I, I wanna stay in the office till five or whatever, but I'm just done and my brain's done, I'm gonna go home and I'm just gonna play with my kids. If I have uh, an elders meeting or something in the evening and I have, or a counseling appointment and, uh, and I know that I'm gonna be here for another three or four hours from six to nine or 10 in the evening, I'm gonna give myself permission to go leave early and go on a, a run. And I know not all of us have you know, scheduled. I'm just telling you what, what I had to do for me. I had to say, in order to be the best pastor I could be, in order to be the best dad I can be, in order to be the best friend I can be, in order to be the best child of God I can be, I have to find moments where I'm intentionally seeking Sabbath for myself. And I don't know what that looks like in your context. But my challenge is that you would seek it. However you can. So you know your homework. Don't do the thing where you come to church and you listen to the message and you go out and you get in your car and you say to whoever you're in the car with, oh, that was a good message and drive home and don't do anything about it. And then you email me in six weeks and say, Ryan, I'm depressed, I'm not feeling right, I'm all sorts of burnt out. I'm gonna say, you did the thing where you listened and you just got in your car and you didn't do anything, didn't you? This is a chance to hit the reset button. Let's hit the reset button. Let's enjoy our rest. Father in heaven, thanks for this day. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you for your word and thank you, God, for the example that you gave us. Even though you didn't need it, you chose rest. And so God, I pray that we would choose it as well. I pray that we wouldn't grind through life and end up at the end of this thing. 
looking back and saying, I wish I had, I wish I would have. Um, God, help us to be wise now. And enjoy our lives now. And God, in the midst of that Sabbath, in the midst of seeking all of it, I pray that we would find those moments to thank you for the love that you offer us. In the midst of sitting down and watching a football game on our Sabbath, God, I pray that during that time out, we would say, God, thank you for this opportunity of rest. In that moment where we're on the walk with our wife or our husband or our friend or whoever, we would, we would just offer that prayer. God, I praise you that I get this Sabbath. But God, it starts with intentionality. And so we're gonna take that step today. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.